So welcome everyone. Tonight we have a great event lined up. And first of all, I want to acknowledge that um, we're on the traditional land of the Shtonemok and Shtominas First Nations. And I want to mention in particular that this will be the time of the herring. And the herring was such an important food source for thousands and thousands of years. And it was treated as a food source, not as a source of income. And the laying of the, of the cedar branches together, the herring eggs and the eating of the herring eggs became such an important part of that culture. And today we're in danger of destroying the herring by overfishing it and destroying the herring, um, the main areas where they gather. So I'm glad that the current fisheries minister has taken a tougher attitude towards the herring and protecting it. The herring is the, the bottom of the food chain for so many things and so important. And we need to, part of honoring the, the First Nations, you know, um, stewardship of the land is their stewardship of the herring. So um, we are the Yellow Point Ecological Society and we host a wide range of activities, including educational webinars like tonight. My name is Guy Dornsey. I'm president and one of the team in the Yellow Point Ecological Society. We champion we're championing a project to build a safe and separated Yellow Point Trail. We're about to run our second annual bio blitz at the end of April. We'll soon be working with an MBA student from VIU to develop the business case for buying land to start a green burial park in Yellow Point or Cedar. We're working on a variety of approaches to try to protect the forest in Yellow Point and Cedar from assault by chainsaw and to protect the wetlands, the frogs and other species. We will be helping our members in area H of the CVID to understand and become engaged in developing the new official community plan, see Take 5 magazine in April. Our members pick up litter on the local roads as part of the Yellow Point Trash Challenge. And we do our bit to remove invasive plants, including broom and a big invasive patch of ivy in the heart of Hema Park that was gradually spreading down the hill, but no more. So tonight we have as our guest speaker and presenter, Alison McCabe. Alison is a horticulturalist, she's a teacher, and she's the plant wise coordinator at the Invasive Species Council of British Columbia. She holds a certificate and a BSc in horticulture from Vancouver Island University and Kwantlen Polytechnic University, and a master's in land and water systems from UBC, where she studied the phytoremediation of mine tailings. She's an avid naturalist, an educator, and a gardener who's passionate about protecting BC's amazing biodiversity. Over to you, Alison. Thank you. I'm just going to share my screen. Um, how is that looking? Looking very good. Looking good? Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, thanks for um, joining us virtually tonight. I'm really excited to be presenting for you all on behalf of the Invasive Species Council. And tonight, uh, like you said, I'll be talking about um, invasive species or invasive plants that affect Vancouver Island and what you can do about them in your own backyard and beyond. But before I start, I just wanted to acknowledge that I am presenting virtually um, as an uninvited but grateful guest from the traditional, ancestral and unceded lands of the Stolo people in so, uh, what is called Abbotsford and that uh, we gratefully acknowledge all the territories of the indigenous people of BC where we live and work to maintain healthy ecosystems for all. Um, my dog's just going crazy with the zoomies back there, so I hope he's not too distracting. <laughs> um, so for tonight, we'll talk, I'll just uh, briefly go over us as an organization. I'll talk about invasive species sort of more generally. We'll do a little guessing game, um, go over some invasive plants of Vancouver Island, and then um, I'll show you what uh, you can do about it. So just a bit about us. Um, we have been around for 16 years and we work to spearhead behavior change in communities, organizations, governments, and industry to help protect our province from invasive species. Uh, we are the largest invasive species uh, charity in Canada and we have quite a broad reach, um, including education, outreach, and training, as well as a lot of good um, cross-border collaboration across Canada, as well as internationally. And we're also a founding member and co-chair of the Canadian Council, which is the national voice uh, of invasive species in Canada. Um, I'm just curious, how many of you are familiar with our work? 
if you'd like to just sort of note in the chat if you've um, worked with us or volunteered with us in any capacity, I'm just sort of curious. We could have done a quiz on that or a poll if you'd asked in advance. We'd set. Oh, you're right. Yeah, I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah. Good, good point. Um, yeah, so our mission is to take action to build healthy landscapes, habitats, and communities through education and responsible practices to prevent the spread of invasive species. So Guy already introduced me. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, this is me. I've recently gotten really into amphibians as well as plants. So here's me with um, an organ spotted frog and then uh, me with a very tall mullein, which as most of you might know, it's an invasive species. But I also wanted to note, I have my colleague um, Cassidy here today. So Cassidy has been very busy. Um, it's the start of field season with invasive species removal but she helped a lot in this presentation and she's pretty invaluable when talking about how to get rid of certain plants. So I definitely, I wanted her here and she's gonna help with the Q&A portion too. So Cassidy, I'll just throw it over to you as well. Sure, um, hi everyone. Yeah, I'm Cassidy. Um, I have a Bachelor of Science from UVic um, in biology and environmental studies. And then I did a diploma in the restoration of natural systems. Um, and that's basically my passion is restoration. So replanting after removing invasive species. Um, but yeah, this is me. I love fish. So that's a picture of me with uh, my fishing waders on and riparian restoration is my favorite. But yeah, happy to answer any questions. And like I said, I'm um, coordinating for the Nanaimo action team. So if any sites pop into your mind that you want invasive species removal at, um, send me an email or let me know later. Thank you, Cassidy. I might've switched that a little bit fast. So, uh, <laughs> so just before we get started really into the, the content, there's three main terms you might hear a lot when dealing with plants. And that is invasive, exotic, and native. And I just wanted to go over what is the difference and why it sort of matters. So invasive species, oh, what is happening? Sorry, everyone. Ooh, okay, I haven't been on Zoom in a minute. All right, so an invasive species is not native to a given area, but also it reproduces quickly. Um, it harms the environment, economy, and or human health. So. It doesn't just have to be from far away. It also has to have some sort of negative impact uh, on its surrounding. Oh, sorry, what is happening here? You'll get there, don't worry. One day. <laughs> Let's see. You've got a tomato up now, it's looking good. There we go, okay. <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah, so exotic, um, on the other hand, that means it originates from far away. Um, so that's like a lot of our popular bedding plants like petunias, um, tomatoes is one, but they don't have a negative impact on the economy or human health or the environment. So there's lots of even woody shrubs like Japanese um, maple, witch hazel, um, but they haven't been shown to have any invasive tendencies in our ecosystems yet. Um, but when your goal is ecosystem restoration, uh, like habitat or pollination related, it does tend to be better to plant native species. But when we say something is exotic or non-native, we don't necessarily mean it's um, invasive. And then we have our native species. And these are the living things that are indigenous to and um, have developed um, with their surroundings as part of an ecosystem. And I get the sense we have a lot of uh, native plant fans in the audience tonight, being an ecological society. So um, maybe just for fun, if you wanna type your favorite um, native plant in the chat, we can go ahead and do that. I'm just kind of curious. So these guys are adapted to local conditions and they've co-evolved over usually thousands of years with other species, predators, um, diseases, and climate factors. Like this lovely bleeding heart here. And invasive plants is sort of the focus of this presentation tonight. Um, it's any non-native plant uh, capable of causing economic, social, or environmental harm. So invasive plants are, are like I said earlier, were classified because they have negative impacts on the environment, um, the economy, or human health. 
And one classic example I'm sure you're um, familiar with is this Himalayan blackberry. Um, it rapidly takes over native vegetation and non-vegetated areas. It reduces habitat for animals and uh, reduces recreation area for humans. And of course, it's very expensive to remove and control. So it's sort of uh, that invasive on all fronts. Um, but uh, compared to a weed, if we say something is a weed, that is more of a value judgment. Um, the term weed can be somewhat arbitrary depending on the context. There are several native species that some, some gardeners consider weeds. Um, horsetail or uh, equisetum comes to mind. So horsetail is actually native throughout temperate North America and doesn't damage ecosystems, but some gardeners can get a bit irritated with it as it tends to be really hard to eradicate in planting beds. But the distinction when we talk about weeds versus invasives is um, weeds do not necessarily impact either the economy, human health, or the environment. They're just sort of more of a nuisance, maybe, depending on, on the term or, and the context. Um, just to make things a tiny bit more confusing, when something is called a noxious weed, um, that is a legislative term. So noxious weeds are provincially regulated, um, typically because they're the worst of the worst when it comes to impacts. And they are designated uh, by the BC Weed Control Act. And the difference um, between noxious weeds and just a run of the mill invasive is that private property owners and government agencies are mandated by law to control these species that occur uh, on their property or jurisdiction. Um, I'll just note this too. Um, I, I think there's another talk scheduled in April that'll go more in detail on EDRR and reporting, but just because we have all these problems with so many different invasive species, the government has taken a really proactive approach to um, invasive species identification and management. And um, that's called early detection and rapid response or EDRR. So the point is to find, identify, and eradicate these new species before they're able to reproduce and disperse beyond their point of entry. Um, so invasive plants uh, within the process are either not present in BC or present in very small numbers. And um, we basically are just trying to keep them out. So the EDRR approach really relies on the public, um, people who are just out and about. So if you see something that you, you haven't seen before, you should report it. Um, and it's one of the reasons that community science and reporting is so important, but I will talk about reporting a tiny bit at the end of this presentation, but just know when I, when I talk about EDRR plants, it means um, ones we really want to keep out of the province, um, but they're not quite, uh, they haven't really uh, to have gotten a good foothold yet in the province. So some traits of invasive plants that they all sort of share is often they are prolific seed producers. Um, they spread easily and effectively uh, vegetatively. So whether that is by rhizomes or stem fragments, they're able to establish quickly and thrive in many different habitats. And then they lack natural predators or pathogens. So one example of, of a bad invasive um, you might be familiar with is yellow flag iris. This one uh, spreads by rhizomes, but it also spreads by seed and the seeds are able to float. So those are already two really good mechanisms um, for the plant to reproduce far and wide. So it spreads by rhizomes in its immediate area and then the seeds can travel like miles downstream and um, grow wherever they sort of land in a, a good patch of soil. So they typically have a few different mechanisms of spread. That's why they're so successful. Um, yeah, and there's, there's many of them. So in terms of impacts, and just as an example, um, giant hogweed causes these really bad blisters. It's got a phyto, phototoxic sap that when the sap gets on your skin and then you're exposed to sunlight, it causes this reaction that can damage your skin quite a bit. Um, so that one is a concern for that reason, especially when you have kids and pets and stuff in the area. So that's one you always wanna report as well. And then puncture vine, which is more of an Okanagan species, but it's able to puncture car tires and bike tires and 
it, it really impedes recreation. So there's lots of reasons why we don't want invasive species beyond the, the fact that they do alter the biodiversity of our province. Um, there's typically lots of, of reasons we don't want them. So, oh, that's not gonna work. One sec, okay. Well, I'll just show you these. Um, <laughs> so I was gonna do a little quiz, but I apparently am not uh, the best at Zoom these days. It's been a while since I've done a presentation, but I'll just show you a couple of examples. So a native species, one that has evolved, co-evolved with lots of different plants and animals in our environment is of course the lal, um, compared to this foxglove, which a lot of people think is native because it is so naturalized and widespread throughout the province. Um, but that one is not from here. And then we have our purple dead nettle, which is also in a lot of lawns uh, on, on Vancouver Island. That one is an invasive. Um, we've got fireweed, which is a nice native, but it looks sort of similar to the foxglove if you're not sure. And then in the interior, um, baby's breath is a bad one. So just to now go over some um, practical tips for management. I thought we could talk about English ivy. So I know that's a big problem on the island and I'm sure all of you have dealt with it at some point. So this guy um, is from Europe. It's got those really nice, well, I shouldn't say nice, those evergreen vines um, and it spreads by seed as well as um, spreading quite rapidly. And it forms those dense monocultures and, and really damages trees. So the trees, um, the weight of the vines can uh, injure them and it can also damage infrastructure as well if it grows on houses or structures. So to prevent that one, you really wanna get ahead of it before it starts taking over. So destroying single plants or new infestations early, um, before it's able to flower and produce seed, and then maintaining a, a strong competitive perennial plant cover, preferably um, with native species. Uh, with a lot of invasive species, um, which you probably have noticed, whenever there is like bare land, they tend to be the first ones to show up. So it's really good, especially when you're getting rid of invasives, you always want to replant. Um, with natives or you want to really take care of the site. So nothing's able to establish there. When um, the English ivy is on a tree like growing above ground, um, you wanna cut and pull them down. If they're growing um, on a tree, it's best to cut them at chest height. And if you keep doing that, it will eventually die. And it does take a few years to eradicate, like with most invasive species, you have to kind of keep at it. Um, so really with this one, it's sort of about being just consistent about cutting and pulling them, pulling them down, or if it's on a tree, just you keep cutting it at, at chest height until it dies. Um, Scotch broom, this one is a really bad one on the, on the, um, on the island, especially on the highways, but it is possible to get rid of this one. And uh, I don't know if you've ever worked with broom busters, but um, they've done a really good job in Qualicum of almost eradicating it there. So it is from Europe. Um, it was brought over as a horticultural plant. It's got those really bright yellow flowers and the, the five angled stems. And it's formed really dense thickets. But the real reason we don't like this one at all is because it does shade out conifer seedlings. Um, and it's also highly flammable just due to all the volatile oils it has. But for this one, it is possible to get rid of it if you cut it when it's in bloom. So you don't wanna be digging it up or anything like that. Um, when it flowers or just before it flowers, you can cut two centimeters below the crown of the plant. And if you're consistent with doing that, you should be able to sort of get rid of it. If it's a really small stem, you can just pull it out. Um, and again, this is something that you kind of have to keep at um, for a few years in a row, but they've done a really good job in, in Qualicum. And I think, I think they um, do work with lots of, of different jurisdictions as well. But that one, you really don't wanna disturb the soil too much because the seed bank can have a lot of 
a lot of seeds in it. Um, spotted knapweed is a herbaceous, or herbaceous perennial. So the flowers are purple, sometimes white. They are called spotted because they sort of look, have this like spotted appearance on the, the bracts there. And the stems get um, smaller as it goes down the, or sorry, the leaves get smaller as you go down the stem. So that's one good way to tell what they are. Um, they do increase runoff and erosion. They displace native plants and they're allelopathic. So they prevent the growth of other plants nearby. And for these ones, you always want to report um, pulling, cutting or mowing prior to seeding is a good idea. If you can uh, do that before seed set, then you prevent uh, spread of seeds. Um, but if it's got flowers on it, you'll want to bag the plant and remove from the site uh, just to discourage the production of any seeds. And again, a few years of that, um, and you should be able to make a dent in it. And for blackberry, there's a couple species of concern. So Himalayan blackberry is the really bad one um, that forms those huge thickets. Um, it is most effective to dig up the root balls and remove them from the site for both of these. There are one thing with Himalayan blackberry especially, I don't think you wanna do this during nesting season because some birds do use it to nest in. And I'm not sure what months that would be, but that one's just one to be mindful of, especially if you're removing a, a large patch of it. But cutting alone can stimulate um, regrowth. So we don't wanna just cut it because that'll just make it grow longer. And that's the same with the cutleaf blackberry, which doesn't form as large thickets, but is also a, a bit of a nuisance and prickly. Um, yellow flag iris, uh, more of an aquatic plant. Uh, the flowers are bright yellow and the leaves are a green. When they're just coming up, they're almost like a bluish color, but they do form those really thick rhizomes and they have the floating seeds that I showed earlier and they outcompete our, our riparian species that birds use for nesting. Um, for this one, there's a couple ways you can go at it. The best way is to have a benthic barrier to smother the plant. So some type of textile or a black plastic to smother them. And you, I think it's a few months you wanna do this for. I think um, Cassidy might have better um, intel on that than I do, but the benthic barrier seems to work uh, the best but it does take some work. There's, they've done a good job in Abbotsford in a little wetland, just having black plastic as a benthic barrier for a few years in a row and they've really knocked it back. But again, it's a lot to do with um, consistency. Um, spurge laurel. So this is another one that was brought over as a horticultural plant, just um, very similar to, to most of the ones that I've showed you already actually. Um, so the flowers are very fragrant, um, but this is a really toxic plant that forms dense thickets, especially, oh, I forgot the name. There's an island right across from Nanaimo that has it really bad. Um, and you, when you're removing this one, you do wanna wear the appropriate PPE. The sap is quite, quite toxic. Um, you can hand pull the smaller plants or you can cut them similar to broom, just two centimeters below um, ground level for that one. And then we have English holly. So this one um, is spread far and wide by birds. Um, you've probably seen it when you're out and about. The, the leaves are quite pokey. And this one, again, sort of similar to the scotch, it shades out native species, but it also hogs water. So this one is really important to get at when it's young. It's really hard to remove the big ones, but you can hand pull the small ones uh, when you see them come up. And then for larger ones, you can use a hand saw or a weed wrench. And yeah, that one, again, you wanna do it probably just before it's flowering. You don't wanna do it when there's berries and that one, um, yeah, you wanna get at it earlier, earlier than later just because the birds do love that one and, and they're able to spread it quite far into the forest. And then for disposal methods, there are two sort of options um, depending on what kind of plant you have. So 
if the plant only spreads through seed dispersal and not vegetatively like Himalayan balsam or touch me nots, you can leave the plant biomass on site. So like the stems and the leaves, but you wanna take all reproductive parts to the landfill. So any flowers or berries or fruit you want to landfill. That's only if they only um, grow through seed dispersion. So you really have to know your plant. On the other hand, um, if it's a plant that can grow vegetatively from any part of the plant, like spot broom, English ivy, or yellow flag, you'll want to take everything off-site in landfill. So not leaving um, any stems or anything like that on the site, because you can get new plants growing from that. And it's also good for plants that are really toxic, like spurge laurel. You don't really want to leave those there. So um, some of you might already be familiar with our behavior change programs. Um, we have a suite of behavior change programs that are aimed at educating and empowering different groups of people in BC to stop the spread of invasive species. So on the plant side of things, I have circled here, we've got three. So plant-wise, is the program that I work in and that's aimed at reducing invasive species in the horticultural industry because we do still have so many um, invasive plants being circulated whether that's they're being sold or traded. Um, we're trying to work with um, greenhouses and growers and gardeners um, trading on Facebook marketplace and things like that to choose alternatives. So if you go to our website, you can look at each of these behavior change programs a little bit more closely, but the plant-wise one we recently redid, and we have a program called the Grow Me Instead that we've listed um, 33 of the most common invasive species in the horticultural industry. And then for each one, we've listed five alternatives, each with um, lots of information on the species. We've listed the zone, um, the water use, the exposure, and any ecological benefits the plant might have. And we've also denoted if it's, if it's native. So that's a really good resource for gardeners. I encourage you to look at that. Um, for outdoor recreators, we have our Play Clean Go. So that one is centered more around plants that are easily spread either by attaching to pets or boots or gear. So that one, the emphasis is really on educating people, especially when you're going on lots of hikes or in being in the backcountry, to make sure to like brush off your boots and wash your gear, brush your dog in between sites so you're not inadvertently spreading seeds or plant parts um, throughout the province. Sort of related um, when we talk about aquatic plants. So thinking back to the flowering rush and the yellow flag iris, we have clean drain dry because a lot of those floating seeds especially and plant fragments can be spread on um, watercraft, boats, uh, other things you might use in the water. So that one as well as being meant for um, aquatic species is also good for plants. And then we have um, don't let it loose and buy local, burn local, which are for um, the pet industry and then the firewood camping industry as well. But lots of information on those, less on the plants, but yeah. So you can check on our, our website uh, for more information and, and resources on, on each of those programs. All right. And then just like a quick, um, note on reporting, even though I think next this April will be a more um, in-depth one about the importance of reporting and, and community science. Um, so we've got two apps that we recommend when you're out and about in the field seeing plants, whether they're invasive or not. Um, the Report Invasives app, um, that's the BC government's app, lets you report different invasive species of plants and animals. And it's got a really easy, simple interface. You can also use it offline, which is really nice. And it'll just send it when you're back in Wi-Fi or, or data service. So if you see something, even if you're not sure if it's invasive, that's also helpful. Um, and you think you see what it is, um, you can put it into the Report Invasives app. It'll be looked over by 
government experts. If it is the invasive plant, they might come and eradicate it. I had one, I looked, I found a Daphne in an area in Chilliwack and um, one of the employees reached out to me saying they had never seen a Daphne there before and they were gonna go get rid of it. And I thought that was really cool. They took the time to follow up and yeah, I felt like I made a little bit of a difference. So that was nice. Um, and then on the iNaturalist side of things, it's not just for invasives, it's for all species. Um, it is useful for identification. So it's got that really good artificial intelligence component that helps you ID the plant, but it's more so for um, contributing to biodiversity data collection and mapping um, worldwide. So both of these apps are really great. Um, I recommend trying them both out if you haven't already. And I think um, Cassidy might be able to share the links in the chat if you're if you're curious. Um, and not only is it fun to report, but you're also contributing really valuable data to inform um, conservation. So yeah, that was um, a very quick uh, intro on invasive plants in uh, on Vancouver Island. Um, but definitely happy to answer uh, more specific questions that you might have and and cast too for removal. Um, yeah, I think, I think that wraps it up. Righty, Alison. Thanks so much for that. If you want to stop sharing, we can. Um, yeah. This is an opportunity for questions, your local plant questions and this, that, the other, whatever. So if you want to put them in the chat, I'll keep an eye on that. And there's a lot of stuff being in the chat while Alison was chatting. Um, I see that you've been over on Newcastle Island off the Nymo, covered in spurge laurel. You pulled thousands from the island last year. And Crystal Tufts is saying they're avid Scotch broom non lovers on their property. So, why That's did, one, um, Newcastle? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I forgot the name. And Jacqueline Shirk is saying that everywhere the loggers clear cut, the Scotch broom grows like crazy. Yeah, there's a close connection between the clear cuts and the Scotch broom. Right? And we should add between the risk of forest fire. Because in a clear cut, the temperature is that much higher. The forest actually keeps things, you know, as much as 20 degrees cooler. So um, while you're gathering your questions, I want to share a question that's come up from Hallie Swift. And to do that, I'm going to actually, she and her family link, um, are stewards of Link Island. And if you know Gabriola, I'm going to show you an image of Link Island in a minute. I just lost my PowerPoint. Um, to the south of Gabriola, you have Mudge Island. And then, then coming up with my share screen here. We go. And then the next island down, we have Link Island. So it, it's in between Mudge and De Corsi, And you'll see it's, it's thoroughly forested there. And they've been stewarding that land since 1963. And her, her question around this, I can just manage the. Hang on, I've got to stop that because <laughs> she sent it to me my email is we need help, all the help we can get with tansy and thistle. For tansy, there are two sites that are each about 400 square feet with seedlings that take a lot of time to clear, very smaller sites. For the thistles, one side is 60 square feet. It's easy to manage. The deer are preventing the succession of maples, oaks, arbutus and fir and all the herbaceous plants. And probably when her grandmother or maybe even great grandmother first sailed to Lincoln Island in 1963, they camped among a flock of feral sheep, which originated from the previous owners in the 1880s. The land had been logged between the 1930s and 50s, putting pressure on the ecosystem. But there, under their stewardship, the forests are maturing into second growth Douglas fir and arbutus with occasional gary oak and cedar. And they've got various, several old patch, um, old growth forest patches left. And they've got the sheep off, but the deer still come on. And they want to know that they've put the land under a land trust with the island, with the Nanaimo Area Land Trust. What's their best approach to handling the, the tansy in particular? Tansy is tricky. It's unfortunate that it's tansy. Um, they have super strong roots, like very dense, super thick. Um, and it's it's just tricky to manage. I would usually recommend mowing, but if you mow over it with like a mower or you could just use like a brush cutter and whatnot. Um, if you mow one time that actually stimulates growth. So you would have to mow several times in the year before seeds uh, come up. So yes to that as being the easier route. Um, mm -hmm. The harder route is 
hand pulling it, which I think you mentioned when we were saying this earlier. Um, that's a big area to hand pull though, but it is the most effective and making sure that you're getting out as much as the root content as you can um, is what you're looking at unless um, someone's willing to come on who has their pesticide applicators and is willing to use pesticide on that land. But I would recommend frequent mowing or digging out the roots. Unless Alison, you have another okay. suggestion. Alison, any further thoughts? <laughs> no. Yeah, no, Cassidy would be the expert there. Okay. So Minor Lee Johnson from Salt Spring is saying, could you talk about purslane? It spread through our garden beds last year, she says. I don't know. Alison? I don't, I'm not super familiar with purslane control either. Um, I think that one has a lot to do with your soil content. I would have to look into that one a little bit more though. If you wanted to send me an email, um, I'll just type my email in the chat. Yeah. And while you're doing that, um, Nikki, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question about Gromi and the nurseries? Hi, so uh, one of the chats I see on Facebook is how do we stop nurseries selling invasive species? And we might, you might be marketing Grow Me instead to the gardeners, but what about marketing it through or to the nurseries to get them to sell good supply of native plants and start the question and gardeners' heads about making that choice? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. And we do work with industry. Um, the hard part sometimes is that there's still a really large consumer demand for certain invasive species. So things like periwinkle, um, English ivy in hanging baskets. Um, so sometimes what happens is when we talk to nurseries about not growing or selling these plants, um, it becomes sort of, well, if we don't sell it, then someone else will sell it and we'll lose revenue. And another hard part when it comes to a lot of larger nurseries and um, like bigger box stores is a lot of their growing centers are uh, out east where they're growing these plants that may not be invasive there but are invasive here and they have like centralized ordering. So it's, it's hard logistically and also because there's consumer demand. So while we also we do work with industry and we are recently um, starting to revamp our partnerships with industry because for a while it um, we just needed to, to sort of revisit those relationships. But um, so we are working with them, but more so with the gardeners with the hopes that if we uh, educate all the gardeners, then they'll stop buying those in invasive plants and um, be able to educate and work with um, the greenhouse owners and um, growers. But we are um, currently partnered with a couple of nurseries that have already um, agreed to not sell invasives, which is really nice. There's a, a really good one in Gibson's. And I saw someone mention Satin Flower. They're not an official partner of ours yet, but I have my eye on them because I hear <laughs> nothing but good things about um, them. Um, so if you do find a good local nursery that you know is very ecologically responsible, you might wanna support them, stick with them and, um, yeah, we'll just keep chipping away on the industry yeah. side. We got so you mentioned Saturn flower that answers somebody else's question further down. They they are a native plant nursery, so they only sell natives. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and stream, Streamside sells natives, and Nolt sells native plants. So there's a few of the native plant nurseries. So we yeah, got a, good options. We got a lot of questions here, and um, Cochrane Mowbray had his hand up. Cochrane, do you want to unmute yourself and share your question? Colin Cochran. <laughs> well, while he's reappearing, Sandy McCrew is asking, are there any programs to pay students to remove invasives? There are. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, um, I'm coordinating one of our action teams. Um, this is, we have teams like all over the province. We're actually hiring them or for them right now. So if you know anyone who's interested, check out our website. Um, we have postings in... 10 different cities across the province, um, including Nanaimo. 
Uh, but yeah, it's great. We have a grant from the government uh, through the Stronger BC program. So that's helping to uh, form jobs for people in this type of industry so they can have a skill set that'll take them forward um, to make them more employable in the future. So we'd be a good training program for people so, just starting out. So in my chat, I got 16 messages stored up here. So we need to move. <laughs> so Susanna okay. McKay, do you want to share your question about English Hawthorne? Susanna. Oh, well, I'm curious about that because um, there's there's like a, almost a whole thicket of at, at Buttertubs Marsh, uh, which I know is protected area. Uh, we have it all over our property. Uh, is it really that bad? I think birds are probably eating the, the berries, but um, should we be cutting them down? And if we do cut them down, what do we replace it with? Because that's going to leave, leave a lot of bare land that I think birds are nesting in and definitely eating berries. Yeah. Go, go, you can, go ahead. No, you go ahead, Allison. <laughs> yeah, but add, it. Okay, so, but add anything. <laughs> so um, yeah, that's hard when it's like a big, nice, mature tree that's serving like habitat and, and food. But um, there is a native hawthorn, right, Cassidy? I th anyway, I think there's a native hawthorn. You yeah, can I, I haven't seen very I haven't seen any actually. Yeah, but it is, it's kind of an invasive, like we don't worry too much about it. It's a little bit of a pest, especially in riparian areas. Um, but yeah, you'd, you'd want to replace it with like another probably large woody shrub that also uh, serves like habitat and, and food. Cassidy, what are your thoughts on that one? Um, yeah, I would echo that. There is a native hawthorn um, and to be honest, it's not the most, like the invasive one, English Hawthorne, it's not the most invasive thing in the world. Um, so I think if you were going to spend your time and resources, I would spend it on something else. Um, but I mean, I'm all for removing invasive, so. <laughs> but yeah. So talking about removing, Deborah Beck's got this question about um, dealing with ivy on Piper's Rock. She says, can we reintroduce dried out or dead ivy? back into nature after it's dried out for a season or should we burn it we have problems picking up invasive plants that have been removed from certain areas such as piper's rock when you've got to boat them off so what can what a pile of dead ivy is it best to burn it or let it dry out and let it become biomass again what's the story yeah that's a great question um that's when we are talking about in the disposal slide um every plant's a little different and um disposing of plants can be expensive too if you're taking it to the landfill um, for ivy, I would never leave it in the shade. Um, leaving it on a rock is definitely a good way to leave it to dry out in the sun. Um, another thing you could try is just having a tarp spread down and just leaving it piled on top of the tarp. Um, that'll dry it out over time and eventually it'll just die and you'll know it's dead. It'll be all crusty and it won't regrow. As long as there's no wet portions to it, it shouldn't be able to survive. Right, so a couple of quick thoughts. Jacqueline Shirk says, I think you could eat purslane, right? And Ben Markman, our local regional director in Area H, saying there's a small caterpillar that eats tansy. Do you know about the caterpillar? Can they import the caterpillar onto Link Island? No shaking head going on there, right? Um, and then A. Klakovich is saying, what's your favorite plant ID book or app? I haven't figured it out on iNaturalist. So if, if you're not using iNaturalist and you want a book to cover this stuff, what's a good recommendation? Are you pulling one out, Allison? <laughs> um, the Pojar and McKinnon. There you go. Yeah, so Pojar and McKinnon plants of coastal British Columbia. Um, it's, I was going to say the Bible. That's what it I call it. It is the Bible, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a plant lover's guide to life. I think we all have one, so definitely would recommend to. <laughs> yeah, Nancy, Na yeah, Nancy Turner, one of the authors, is our one of our local plant goddesses around here. Yeah, we love her. <laughs> we got Joan Barway saying that purslane is delicious in salads. Someone saying that satin flowers, the native plant shop, is fantastic. Um, but then Mina Lee Johnson saying, oh, not something purslane, it's tiny and spreads all over the place. And then Ben is saying, was it cinnabar moth caterpillars used for tansy? So jo Janice Beecroft is asking about... Um, Blackberry removal at Creekside and riparian issues. How, how do you handle, if it's on a creek and what's the, Janice, do you want to ask your question to unmute yourself and ask about blackberry removal? 
calling Janice Beecroft. Find your unmute button. No, okay. Jacqueline Shirk is saying that the local blackthorn is called, I'm not gonna get this right. Um, cred, <laughs> Crata, Cret, <laughs> Cret, Cret, Creticus Douglasy, a black hawthorn, grows in borders and ditches, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Miho Matsuo is saying, do you need to do anything with the soil after removing certain invasives and before replanting with native? Do some invasive negatively imp impact the soil from a chemical standpoint? Yeah. yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it really de it depends. Like if it was something like black walnut, your soil might not be good for a few years to grow anything in just because it, it has like a lot of um, things that impede plant growth. Um, but most allelopathic chemicals, like they're just produced as the plant is alive and then they break down fairly quickly. Um, but it depends also because a lot of invasive plants uh, increase erosion, like you might want to add some uh, either compost or, or something just to like remediate the soil if it's somewhere that's either been left pretty bare or or eroded. Um, yeah, Cassidy, what about you? Yep, I concur with all of that. Um, it depends, right? Yeah, it does. It's tricky, but that's a really good question, honestly, making me think. So, so we yeah. got Janice is Janice is with us. Janice, do you want to ask your question about blackberry removal? Yes. Um, sorry about that. I couldn't get my unmute button to work. So we live in a condo on a creek side, and the town came in with some backhoe after they finished uh, unblocking the creek. We got blackberries on our property. And um, if we do, my question is, if we take them out, will all the soil be washed away? Because unless we can plant something else, and what do you suggest we could plant if we took them out by digging them out? That is such a great question. Um, I kind of did my capstone project on something like this. And um, it depends on your city, but when you're too close to, there is like a, for city of Surrey, that's where I grew up, it's five meters. You're not allowed to remove invasive species within five meters of a waterway um, because mm -hmm. of erosion. Um, so anything that lives in the stream, if a bunch of sediments coming in, it would affect all those animals as well. Um, so what I did is I removed up until that five meter point, And then I went and I took snips and I cut two centimeters down um, below the soil level for all of the blackberry canes and removed it that way. And it's not, it's definitely not hundred percent effective, honestly. Um, but it, it works if you keep at it. Um, it's, it's a time consuming process, but I think it would be better than the erosion that you're talking about because blackberry does hold quite a lot of soil well. So that's something good that it does, I guess. But, um, as for something to plant in replace of it, um, kind of depends on if it's like sunny or shady um but good riparian plants I mean I always love salmon berry I love any types of ferns um any any shrub really but I would go on to eFlora um that's one of my favorite websites um and if you do look up a species any native species it'll tell you exactly what it's uh, soil, nutrients, sunshade requirements are. Um, and that's how I have always planted my native gardens is I'll go on there and see what the plants I want need. But I hope, I hope that helps. Thank you. So oh, Mary, nice. Mary Shillabier has a question about foxgloves. She's saying, I'm so sorry to hear that foxgloves are invasive. I've not been pulling it off, is it so lovely? Now, are they really invasive? You don't, I mean, you see patches of broom everywhere, but you don't go around seeing great patches of foxgloves. I mean, are they one that we can tolerate or are they really invasive? Yeah, I actually, I went on a rant about how I didn't think they were invasive, but then my coworker in Victoria said they are pretty invasive in some areas of Victoria. So, uh, it's, I don't like I they are in in certain I think drier like grassland situations yeah. and it is really unfortunate because they are really pretty and they're they're pretty well naturalized um but yeah because they spread so easily by 
by seed, we do recommend. Um, okay. Yeah. So, um, minor leaves, but I'm good to ask, um, I'll just mute her, mute Mary. Yeah. Um, minor leaves got another question on purslane. She's saying that when she researched it last summer, she found it listed as an agricultural problem, very hard to get rid of, comes back very quickly and small. And it's not the same succulent purslane that people like to eat. Oh. And she's a market gardener, so it's been a big problem to control it. Any thoughts on purslane? Interesting. Yeah, that's one of the ones I'm going to have to look into because I'm only familiar with the, the big succulent one, but I, I do have someone I can ask at the council who's okay. good at agricultural yeah. weeds. And I put my email in there, so if they want to email. And, and we have a problem at home personally with periwinkle. I mean, it's it's got mm. these big blue flowers, but my goodness, it digs its roots in. And... Um, we haven't been successful in getting rid of it. It doesn't seem to spread to the forest, luckily. Maybe it just likes sun and open spaces. Any thoughts on periwinkle? Cassidy? <laughs> um, periwinkle, for me, removing out in the field is notoriously annoying um, because it's so delicate to pull out its roots. Mm. Um, it's really like a sit down and take all day kind of job. Um, I don't even think cities do manually remove it anymore. I'm pretty sure that um, Coastal Invasive Species Committee um, just uses pesticide on it. Mm -hmm. um, but I've heard that smothering works um, if left for quite a while. So that's something that you could try, but kind of unsightly for yeah. a yard, but. So let's have two or three minutes on broom. Um, Robert McKechnie is saying, is it true that one should not pull broom, not pull broom? <laughs> Just disturbing the soil allows us. This is very empty. Janice, can you mute yourself? Janice, mute. Janice Beecroft, can you mute? Thanks. As pulling the soil, disturbing the soil allows the seeds to sprout. We don't need to cut it off. So, in my experience, we do a lot of broom pulling in Yellow Pike Park, and the smaller plants, especially in the wet months, come out really easily. Mm -hmm. And the big plants, we cut them off below ground, as you say. Is is um. Do you want to repeat advice for people? And the other thing is, if you're cutting broom in a place where it's a lot of it, you have a large accumulation of big Definitely. plants and getting them off site is a real hassle. So can they just be stashed up in the shade where they won't do anything? Yeah, um, yes, two point answer. Um, for soil disturbance, absolutely. That is um, really concerning. It does stimulate growth. Um, usually what I've done in the past and what I recommend is if, the if the stem is like as big as your pointer finger good to pull if it's bigger than that i would cut it um because then that's when it's disturbing too much soil around it um and like we said earlier cut like two centimeters below the surface um to really cover the top root so it's not receiving any sun um as for removing it um your right broom is huge it's heavy it takes up so much space um if you do pile it deep in the shade. Um, it usually is fine. Um, as long as you're going back to check on it, I would recommend. If you do pile it, I would go back and check in a couple of months, see if there's any new sprouts around it. Um, and if there is, maybe rethink that, but usually it's fine. And, and a follow-up question, we are following the philosophy that it's best to cut when it's in full bloom on the belief that when it's in full bloom, there's the least strength in the roots. Is that folklore or truth? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's truth. Um, it's tricky because you really want to be careful with all the reproductive parts. Um, if there's any seed pods, I've always been taught to leave it. Don't even bother touching it if there's any seed pods on it because the seeds can live for like 20 plus years in the soil. Um, but yep, definitely when it's in bloom is when it's putting out as much energy as it can. So that's a really good way to tackle it when it's in a vulnerable state. So basically during May, because the seed pods are forming by, by mid to late May, and then they might yep. they explode. They throw that seed far away, right? Yeah, broom is my least favorite plant. I on know, the question from <laughs> Alexandra Lake on white invasive white daisies. And she's linking it to soil impairment from chemical impacts. And how does it relate to invasive white daisies, which is invading agricultural land? Are we referencing um, like oxide daisies? Alexandra, do you want to um, unmute yourself and come on and explain? Bottom left is your unmute button. 
She says, yes, it's oxide daisies in the mule. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, I honestly don't know a ton about the soil properties. I know how I would manually remove it, but do you, Allison, do you have any thoughts on soil? I don't. Um, it's, how does it, um, so, so are you meaning like, sometimes plants, especially invasive plants are attracted to certain like low nutrient soils, um, but, and then they can also impact soil. So are you looking kind of more like what kind of soils does oxide daisy like, or is there ways to like amend your soil to get rid of them? Because I, I don't know for that species in particular, but um, I could definitely look that one up for you. That it's more of a problem as far as I know in the interior, I think, in a little bit of a drier, drier spot. So I'm not as familiar with it. Yeah, we have some, they're very beautiful. We have oxide daisies growing along the roadside quite a lot. Um, they mm -hmm. come up later in July or so. So Deborah Beck's throwing in useful information from the city of Nanaimo has an invasive drop zone for plants at Bowen Park on Saturday, May the 28th, between 10 and two. So that's clearly timed partly for the broom. So bring your plants along and they'll dispose of them for you. And and um, Alexandra Lake is saying, I think with the oxide daisies, most agricultural fields on salt spring are now covered with them. Mm. Right? And it's poisonous to some livestock. Yeah. Yeah. So talk about Buddleia, because people might think, oh, it's wonderful for the butterflies, but. <laughs> yeah, Buddleia um, is not good at all. And it's really unfortunate because it's so invasive that there is a lot of money and research putting put into making sterile hybrids, but now they're finding, and for a while we said sterile hybrids are okay. Um, but what we found now is like a few, like 20 years down the road or 10 years down the road, a lot of these sterile hybrids are, are not sterile anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so <laughs> they spread like wildfire. And one thing that I hear a lot from people is like, always they're always like I never see it spreading in my yard so it can't be invasive but a plant's whole mission is to spread as far and wide as it can and Buddleia is one of those ones you, yeah you might not see it sprout in your yard but it's probably in the riparian area somewhere and um yeah so that one there's way better plants for butterflies than are native um and Asclepias. <laughs> And there's one, there's lots of other ones too. Anything with a lot of nectar, um, there's good native plants for that. And I would not recommend yeah. butterflies. So in, in the in the learning we've done around the importance of native plants and butterflies, we've made this, we've been taught, learned how to make this really important connection that the 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 native moths and butterflies have had a million years to get a particular dependency on a particular native plant mm -hmm. and so they'll lay their eggs there and the caterpillars come there and the the birds the songbirds and you know there's need those caterpillars so one chickadee during its six month breeding season might have six thousand caterpillars it needs and it needs the native plants because the the moths and butterflies will only lay on those native plants whereas the the imported the, the invasives have been here a hundred years ago so there's no connection to the to the birds and the and the, the caterpillars so when i when i really tuned into this i understood that if you want your 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 wild your your wild birds and your songbirds you must have the caterpillars and you must have the native plants and to the extent that the invasives are pushing out the native plants they're really harming the songbirds yeah so jacqueline is saying the best advice on buddleia is who love their buddleias don't let it get huge enough that you can't remove the blooms before they go to seed so if you're cutting, having a buddleia only to cut the blooms to have in the house, because they're pretty, then you've got it under type control, right? Going back quickly to the oxide daisies, um, Alexandra's Lake is saying poisonous to some livestock. And David Haley says that many of the hay fields in Cedar and Yellow Point are getting covered with an oxide daisy, which affects the quality of the feed in the hay, if it's got toxic qualities to it. So clearly oxide daisies are a bigger thing than um, we thought about. And Nikki's saying that stinging nettles are great for butterflies. Stinging nettles are native, of course, right? I, yeah. I, yeah, right. Stinging nettles are also necessary for our endangered organ forest snail. Yeah. Do you want to talk for a minute about the best, um, the converse of invasive is native? Just to refresh people, where do they go to buy native plants? Do you want to just do a quick refresh, of course, for, for us on that while more questions are coming? And I'm, I'm filling in time here, right? <laughs> yeah, so... I think someone mentioned the satin flower. Um, there might be some other ones. I know on the mainland, Nat's so, nursery. Yeah, you're not local. Maybe, Nikki, do you want to come on and talk about the best place to buy native plants as a, as a local islander? 
So yeah, Saturn Flower in Victoria is great because they've got several sites where they, they, they grow the seed. So they produce in quite high um, quantity and they also have excellent consulting services if you don't know what you want to grow. Um, closer to home, we have the Nanaimo Area Land Trust Nursery, which is a small, small nursery, um, interesting plants and, and we're quite low on selection at the moment because of um, yeah, got shortages. And then I believe Streamside has native plants. Um, there is actually where, where is Streamside? Yellow Point. I think it's North Nanaimo. Oh, near Bowser. Near Bowser, yeah. Okay. Um, and then, strangely enough, places like Dinters have a native section, a native plant section. I think Priscilla likes their their plants because they're and Dinters. Um, Dentists, okay. they have a native plant section. Great. It's small, but um, it's great that people see there's a choice and then, you know, they make the choice. Yeah. Yeah. And um, the Nault Nursery is up Spruceton Road. And Rob O'Kane okay, yes. is saying Streamside Nursery at Bowser. They propagate and sell a wide range of plants. They're really great. Yeah. Joanne Bars might say there's not much at Dinters. Um, Carrie, you've got your hand up. You're muted. Okay. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. I do. I was looking. Um, I noticed you were mentioning um, that you've got into amphibians. That was one of the favorite things. I wanted to find some amphibians when I was out doing my mapping for the uh, mapping of the wetlands, uh, which I did get to find. And um, I saw the one that you had in and um, that you were talking about, the spotted organ. Is that right? Spotted, organ spotted frog. Yeah. 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 OK. And that's native to here. Uh, I'm in the Fraser Valley, and okay. there's a there's a Fraser Valley population. There's a couple small Fraser Valley populations. Yeah, I don't know if it's on the island. I don't think so. Think so. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. Okay. You're so welcome. We got um Kyle chipping in, and Kyle is a neighbor of mine, and she's had horses for years and years. She says that lime discourages daisies, the horse eye daisies, in pastures. And Cassidy to that end is saying oxide daisy could be tricky to be honest. Mowing is great to reduce seed production, but the seeds can remain viable in the soil for several years. I've heard that grazing specifically by sheep and goats has helped reduce populations. Manual removal must include digging up the roots, but maybe spreading lime is a, a good way to sort of, you know, cut back on their invasiveness. And so there's nothing left in the chat box. So anyone else got questions or thoughts they want to put? If you put, you just put your hand up if you want to share an idea or an experience. In the in the button called reactions, you'll see a thing. You can raise your hand like that, and then I'll know that you want to um, say something. Right, chip in while you've got these this chance with our experts here. Right. Yes, we got new messages pouring in here. We've got um, Robert Robert saying Streamside Nursery will ship as well if you've got enough to be worth it. Crystal Tufts is saying, we want to we want to purchase plants from a grower. And this whole conversation has got me thinking of setting up a farm stand just past Roberts Memorial Park. Would it be prudent or smart to offer only native plant arrangements? It sounds like it's a bit tricky with the nurseries. Um, Crystal, come on and, and share this. Talk about it in person. You're doing a better, you can do a better job than I can through your chat. Give yourself an unmute and. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. So someone locally asked me today um, our, because they can see what's happening on our property. There's been excavation, a rock garden built, greenhouse going up, these kinds of things, wondering what we're doing. And we're wanting to grow things eventually. Um, but someone asked me from Wildwood if we're only selling native plants. So it's got me thinking that what's happening out there in the world uh, or on Vancouver Island, are people, is that, is that what people want? Or um, like it sounds when Allison was mentioning, you know, we do work with industry and they're, they're saying, well, you know, there's not a lot of revenue. Um, so it sounds like there's a bit of a challenge there because you know, profit versus, you know, what's good for our economy, for our environments. So, because Crystal, when you drive north past Roberts Memorial, is yours the bit of land on the right-hand side with some raised beds all wrapped up in deer fencing? Yes. Okay, gotcha. So you're looking to start a nursery there, but you need to make enough income to keep going, right? 
Yes. So you can see what I mean. Yes. Any recommendations on good plants that um, Crystal can sell from that plant nursery there, including some natives? Yeah, and I don't know from a business perspective, like certainly it seems like the demand for native plants and ecological gardening has gone up, but it's hard because I'm often in these sort of circles like this one where it's, everyone's very ecologically minded. Um, I, I do think there's a market for it and, and there are some really beautiful native plants. Some of them I know can be a bit challenging to propagate. Um, so that might have something to do with it too. Um, but you could, um, maybe look and see what some other native plant nurseries are doing, um, get some ideas, but there are like, there are some exotics that are not horrible. No, there are lots of, there are lots of exotics that aren't horrible. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So you don't, I don't think you necessarily need to limit yourself to native plants. Um, but it's always good to do your, your research beforehand and, and really make sure what you're growing is, is non-invasive. Nikki's pointing out that we are in the UN decade, United Nations decade for ecological restoration. So demand might grow and yellow point propagation, they're in business to do this kind of thing. Um, and it's worth Fraser's Thimble Farm in the North End of Salt Spring as a nursery with a wide range of native plants. So maybe, you know, go and check out, talk to the other nurseries, see what they're selling. Ben Martman brings up a brand new thought that are there any native plants that are fire resistant? Because oh. those, those of us who want to fire smart our properties but not clear cut the entire area, this is a good realm for advice for us, please. <laughs> yeah, actually on our newest version of, of the Grow Me Instead, um, I think Cassidy, did we put the link in the chat? Sorry. Um, we did note which plants are native and which plants are fire smart. And there are some with um, good overlap, but as a general rule, you want to stay away, even if it's not like fire smart listed as a general rule, as long as it, it's not tons of volatile oils and it has like a nice juicy leaf, you're probably good. Um, and there are lots of nice um, natives like that, like the Oregon stone crop or the broadleaf stone crop. Um, trying to think of some other ones. Well, that so, so, so is Salau and Oregon great? Do they, do they have oils in their leaves or are they? I think, it, I can't remember about either of those two now. Okay. I think Salau might be kind of really flammable, uh, but I, I'd have to double check. That you don't know is the answer, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, Susanna's asking about some native plants are going to be, are some native plants going to become, going to become invasive, i.e. hard to control? And of course she brings up horsetail. Now, when you, when you mentioned that horsetail is a weed, horsetail might reply, I've been around since the dinosaurs, all the rest of you are weeds. <laughs> but yeah, I know when we had horsetail on our land in Saanich, it was just black tar, was the, the only way to control it. Those roots go down deep, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, that one, um... Maybe Cassidy has some ideas on how to remove it, but that's kind of my classic one that it's native and it's been here for so long. Um, yeah, it's got a right to be here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But Judy, Cassidy, I, like if you really didn't want it in a garden, like is there a way to control it? Because I've never had any luck. Yeah, just... I'm just I'm wondering if there's anything that I could plant that's native that I'm going to regret. Uh huh. Hmm. Me, if you don't like the look of something. I mean, we do have some real vigorous growers that are native, but they're just kind of doing what plants do. It really depends what kind of garden you want. If you want something super manicured and cultivated, um, yeah, maybe there are some natives that you wouldn't want, but it really depends on the goal of your of your garden and what you like the look of. But there's no native species that really will become invasive. So here's a fundamental question. Pamela, um, so I want to get rid of my lawn. What can I plant instead? Oh, I love this question. Cassidy, you take it. <laughs> no, no, go for it. I mean, I was just going to say I love native gardens. And I think what's becoming really popular um, is having like a moss lawn or a different like native like clover. Is that right, Allison? Um, yeah, clover. Yeah. So it looks really cool. You don't have to mow it all the time because it just moderates itself um and it's actually good for all the insects and whatnot around us that are native to here whereas our invasive grasses can definitely um be home to nuisance pests i don't know if we have chafer beetle on the island but where i grew up in the lower mainland chafer beetle is a huge issue right now so yeah i love that can i go aqueous for a while and talk about the milfoil on um quinell lake 
you may. <laughs> My goodness, it's got it's got we got yellow flag iris all around it, and of course it looks so beautiful, but it's really completely out of control. And we got the Asian is it Asian milfoil? It's called uh, Eurasian, yeah. Eurasian milfoil. What's the best way to handle that, and how bad is it? Pretty bad. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, Eurasian water milfoil um, is it's honestly pretty difficult to control. Um, a lot of places are just scooping out the mats of it um, and taking it away from the water to dry it. Um, but I think the biggest thing for Eurasian water milfoil right now is to make sure that it's not spreading. Um, that's what we're concentrating in most of our courses is being on top of early detection, rapid response. So if you are seeing that spread to any water bodies around you, um, report it right away so someone can get on top of it before it becomes too much to manage. All righty. So, um, Robert McKechnie, do you want to unmute yourself and share your question, whether it's around Thimbleberry or anything? Yeah, thanks. Hi. Well, this is a fantastic discussion. Uh, about the, to the person that asked about uh, how to replace your lawn, we, in Victoria here in our front and backyard, we use the lasagna method with um, just digging a very uh, shallow angle trench around the edges and then getting uh, appliance uh, cardboard boxes from fridges and stoves, large pieces of cardboard. And, we, and also we had a real invasion of uh, creeping yellow buttercup that you can't dig out. So we just cardboarded the whole yard for a year, took about a year, killed the grass and the buttercup, just leaving it in place. It ra raises the elevation slightly because you're not pulling anything out. And then we just covered it with the leaf mulch, the city here from the leaves they collect on the streets lets us, um, they, they compost it for you and you, I just wheelbarrowed it over and put two or three inches just to keep the cardboard from blowing away. And then when, whatever you want to plant, you just punch holes and put in whether there's vegetables or trees or anything like that and just watch around where you punch the hole to make sure that grass or buttercup doesn't come up. And uh, within a year, it's just uh, completely whatever you've planted. Yeah, my wife Carolyn would certainly second that because she made a lot of times talking about the lasagna beds. You don't need to dig up that lawn. You can yeah. just lay the cardboard and put leaf mulch on top. I wish other municipalities, what sanitation and people do with their leaves is collecting them and mulching them, putting them out for people to take. And it's so great. It's a great service, that is. I wish all municipalities would do that. Yeah, Victoria has so much because we have such an urban forest that the city now just lets anyone from anywhere come. So people- I'm just saying she's the used other. chickens to get rid of all the grass on her lawn, right? Yeah. <laughs> It'll also remove all the all the salal out of a forest if you let them, but that's not, not a good thing. Alexandra Lake is saying, clovers are not all equal. Alcyke clover causes phyto photosensitivity to livestock and causes it spreads to your neighbor's fields that provide foods to livestock. Think of what you plant so all beings can continue to eat. Do you have any thoughts on clovers? Yeah, like for lawns, it's usually a micro clover. I don't know what species that is, and I, I've not heard of, of that one, but um, I didn't realize that. That's interesting. I'm Alexandra, not Ale Alexandra Lake, do you want to unmute yourself and, and explain your, give your clover wisdom? Your mute is in the bottom left hand corner. Nope. Okay, Dave Haley is saying the municipality of North Couch is doing studies on the water color in water quality in Quamichan Lake, which may help give some advice for Quinell Lake and the Eurasian milfoil problem. Yeah, it's very it's poor old Quinell Lake is <laughs> invasives up the yin yang. It's all over the place, right? So we're coming up to wind up time. So this is your chance for any last questions or thoughts you've got to share with um, Alison and Cassidy. And Pamela and Nikki, do you want to share? We're going to do a broom pull on uh, near the Nanaimo River Regional Park, I believe. Nikki, do you want to tell people about that? It's coming up in May. Nikki? Sorry, Guy, I don't know enough. Oh, you haven't got the details. Well, <laughs> Sorry, I need you're... Jane. I need to catch up with Jane. Okay, if, you, if you got this through our email list, you'll be getting details of that broom pull. The one thing about broom pull is if you've got a lot of people you make fast progress and you feel good. It's very hard work if there's just two or three of you. <laughs> you you feel you're making such slow progress, but... Um, but but uh, Cassidy will help us. Okay, that's good. <laughs> and we got a final new message coming in here. So yeah, Jan is just saying thank you everyone. It's been an excellent presentation. So let's do a little thing. We, if you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll think all, think all um, reaction buttons. 
Oh, jo Joanna Barswise saying, you have to cut the broom below the soil, yes. She said, that has been said, cut two, two centimeters below the soil level, push right down with your, your big clippers. In your reactions button, you can share, you can, you can share things like this in your heart. Let's give a big, a big virtual thank you to Cassidy and Alison. And if you go to view all, I'll, I'll go to the gallery, you can see all the little hearts and love coming up. So look, thank you for this. This has been very informative. We'll have it recorded. Um, we'll, share the, we'll, the, we'll share the video with everyone so you can come back and watch it. So thank you both very much. Thank you all, everyone. All this variety of questions, my goodness. And enjoy the rest of the evening. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much, much for having us. Okay. Take so care, lovely. everyone. Yeah. Bye. Press the red end button to say goodnight to you all. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay. Bye.